Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Florian, and uh, for the next 45-ish minutes, I'm going to talk about um, closing the skills gap for distributed technology here at the Open Education MiniConf at LCA 2018. This talk is a little bit sort of the odd one out compared to all the other talks that are here in this MiniConf because it doesn't really deal with what we usually see as education in the narrower sense. That is anything that is primary, secondary, tertiary edu education. Most of the other talks in this conference are about, um, well, basically K through 12 and university. But this is about professional training. This is about actually um, acquiring and maintaining skills for professionals in their jobs in our industry, in the IT industry. And, um, and it talks about, and I've, the first time I did this talk was about, or, or an earlier version of this talk was about two years ago. And uh, when I did it then, when I did the talk originally, it was largely about the technical implementation, the technical aspects of the solution I'm about to present. This time around, I wanna talk a little bit more about the motivation and about the why of um, what we're doing here as opposed to the actual technical details. Although I will mention those as well. So I want to start out with sort of a question or, or, or something to think about, which is when we're dealing with technology adoption, when we're dealing with um, some new technology that is out there on the market that is simply becoming interesting for enterprises. And examples for that are some sort of things that came up as relatively novel over the last, shall we say, 10 years or so. I could, can, I, I could mention things like infrastructure as a service, that is private cloud, uh, microservices architecture, DevOps, distributed storage, software-defined networking, all, all these sort of new things that we're, that we're dealing with in organizations and enterprises of just about any size. The question arises, what's the biggest challenge that we typically face in conjunction or that enterprises typically face in conjunction with the adoption of these new technologies? And you could say that perhaps one of those challenges that we're dealing with is cost. So the necessity to keep expense down and, and margins high. You could also think that one of the major challenges that we're dealing with is scalability. So the, the ability to quickly adapt to a potentially massive or very rapid growth in demand or in your customer base for your products and services. You could also think that one of the key challenges is speed, which is the, the requirement, the necessity to ramp up and to innovate and to go to market quickly. But for all of those, it turns out that the major challenge that enterprises are, fa are facing when it comes to technology adoption is actually none of these. Because while cost and scalability and speed are often cited as the motivators for why we want to adopt this technology in the first place, the primary challenge that organizations are facing in adopting and in rolling out these technologies is a challenge of skill. That is to say, having on your team the people that know and understand and are able to maintain these increasingly complex, increasingly distributed systems. Because simply we're, we're dealing with a whole nother level of complexity once you go from, say for example, the starting point of a relatively monolithic application that runs on a single server to something that is inherently distributed over a, a, a whole number of pieces of hardware, virtualization solutions, private and public cloud architectures, and so forth. So that's a problem. We simply don't have enough people that have the capabilities, that have the capacities to maintain and manage these distributed systems. So when these skills are rare and when these skills are in high demand, then the obvious question is why don't we build them? Why don't we make it easy for people to acquire these skills? preferably in a manner that is itself cost-effective and scalable and fast, and that also works in distributed teams. Now, unfortunately, when we look at how these, 
how organizations typically work and teams typically work in building up these skill sets and in acquiring these skill sets, then we find that the conventional method of doing that is a really, really poor match for the requirements that we actually have. Because most of us, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but, or, or if your experience has been otherwise, but most of us, when we're acquiring a new technology, there is the option that we can do it entirely on our own. So basically, you know, we use some time or um, that, we, that we sort of carve out of our schedule and we dive into a specific subject and we get into, you know, we get, we get ourselves involved in the respective communities and we dig through the documentation and we fire up a test server or a test environment and so forth and we learn everything on our own. So that's one end of the spectrum. But the other end of the spectrum But we don't do that in a face-to-face -face fashion, but let's shoot a video of that person. And then we subject the people who want to acquire this skill to basically watching a talking head for a long time. And that is not engaging, right? That is, not some, that, that, that is a bad idea for a variety of reasons. On the one hand, it tends to become boring. Um, I mean, you can do video-based content that is really, really good, right? Um, and, and, you know, you can take cues from, say, for example, the top educators on, on, on YouTube on how you do this sort of thing. But it, that tends to be really expensive if you actually want to build, like, a video content that is actually conducive to getting very complicated topic, topics across. If you want to do that right, it's going to set you back a lot more than just, you know, shooting a talking head that someone then listens to. And so the thing that you can get for cheap is really not very effective at all. And also there's things like it is much easier to parse a specific bit of information or to skim over a large, uh, uh, large set of information and just retrieve sort of the important bits out of it when you can read over it. That's practically impossible when you want to selectively listen to someone over 45 minutes. So in order for a video to actually be useful, it has to be transcribed so that it is searchable. So that means that every time you're reshooting part of the video, you, of course, have to redo the transcript as well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So bottom line, this is really a stopgap measure that doesn't really do very well for you. But still, <clears throat> a lot of self-paced training, ostensibly self-paced training that you can get out there relies on attendees watching an instructor on video and then presumably self-studying documentation. And now when you think about that, that means that we have this very, very complex and distributed technology that we're dealing with, like software-defined networking. That's no easy matter, right? Um, and still we have this expectation, the conventional way of how we're doing training uh, conveys this expectation that this is how you're supposed to understand and actually be able to manage these increasingly complex distributed systems without, mind you, ever actually touching one that you're allowed to break, right? And I don't have like a good analogy for how crazy that actually is, except that to me that resembles a little bit like sitting an astronaut in a lecture theater like this one and then giving them study books and, and some tabletop exercises and things like that and then dragging them out of the lecture theater and strapping them to a rocket and hurling them into orbit without ever putting them in a simulator, right? And that's crazy, but a lot of times in our industry, in the information technology industry, that's how we actually train people and teach people. And that's a broken model. Right? That is not something that we want to do. So, what do we want instead? What do we expect out of, out of an actual learning environment that is worth the name? So first, we want learning environments that actually help us learn what we want to learn and what we need to learn. We want to be able to immerse ourselves in these in these environments. We want them to be as realistic as possible, um, like the astronaut in a simulator, 
And we actually want to be able to do the things that we, we, would, that we would also do in a production system in training. So we need these immersive, these realistic lab environments. We need a, a way to interact directly with our peers. We want to interact with the other members in our learning group, just as we would in our, in, in, in our day to day work. And then, of course, ideally, if we're talking about sort of the technology that can enable that sort of thing, ideally, we'd also want that technology to be open source so we can do all that. We can build all of these systems leveraging the momentum and the speed of open source communities and the platforms that they innovate rapidly and openly. So in my team, we started looking into this a uh, little under three years ago now. My team and I had been doing a fair amount of face-to-face -face teaching for technologies like OpenStack and Ceph and high availability and others. And we were looking for a way to make that better, to make that more scalable, to make it faster, to make it cheaper for our learners. And so we looked around and we said, OK, well, we want a means of doing this in a manner that is self-paced, that is completely self-driven, that can be done from anywhere. Uh, doesn't matter whether the learner sits in, I don't know, in whether they sit in Silicon Valley or in Kenya or in Nepal or in a mining town in Queensland. We want them to be able to learn from where they are using an absolute minimum of resources. And the way that we did this, ultimately, um, and I'll get to in a, in a minute like what our motivations were or what, what, our, what our selection criteria was, but we ultimately ended up with um, the Open edX platform. Uh, the Open edX learning management platform is something that originally came out of MIT, um, and then I believe it was Harvard that was the next university um, that jumped on board, and then, um, and then Stanford, and then And then, um, and then they launched an, a, a not-for-profit consortium in 2013, open sourced their entire stack, and built a very, very capable learning management system. And we combined that with uh, using OpenStack for providing these uh, automatically available learning environments uh, for people. Actually. The way that we, the, the way it worked for us, the way it worked for my team, it was slightly the other way around. We'd already been using OpenStack, like specifically OpenStack Heat for orchestration, for firing up lab environments for learners in our face-to-face -face taught classes. And then we said, okay, we already have that. We can already uh, fire up learning environments, lab environments for people like that. So we can very, very easily set up a, an, an environment that, uh, that, you know, for like 15 people, um, at the same time with essentially one command line call. So now let's integrate that with Open edX and actually make that part of a self-paced learning management, uh, self-driven, self-paced learning management system. And what that gives you, what the combination of those things give us is the ability to say, for example, if we want to have a course that um, teaches people the fundamentals of, say, Kubernetes, Every single attendee gets a Kubernetes cluster that they can then interact with and play with and break and troubleshoot and everything else. And if the subject of the course is to be Ceph, then everyone gets a Ceph cluster. If the subject of the course is to be Hadoop, then everyone gets a Hadoop cluster. So that means we finally actually get a system, a framework, an environment that is, that is cost effective, that is scalable, that is fast, and that is open source. So that's what we wanted to achieve. And now I want to get into the not why did we do this, but why did we select the specific components that we selected? So why would you want, why did we select open edX? Why did we go with that? Well, number one, we wanted to build our, our product around an open platform. And so we basically shopped around for open source LMSs. Um, and that means that not only an open source code base, but also a, a vibrant and active community and so forth. At the time, this is, we're talking 2015, there were about three contenders that we could look into or that we considered. 
Uh, one was Moodle. One was um, a tool coming out of Google called uh, Google Course Builder. And the third one was Open edX. Um, Google Course Builder kind of failed the um, community criterion. Um, it is something that didn't really apparently have a very active and vibrant um, community. It has since, for all intents and purposes, gone the way of the dodo. There, there hasn't been any significant development on that uh, for some time. So that left Moodle on the one hand and Open edX on the other hand. And there were two simple reasons for why we chose Open edX. One, as a team, like with our, with our existing skill set, it was simply much stronger in Python than in PHP. And we, we uh, preferred the extension facility, the extension mechanism that comes with, uh, with Open edX. So extensibility was a very important uh, point for us because we already knew at the time there isn't a learning management system that allows us to interface with lab environments that are spun up on demand. So that is functionality that we would have to build. So what is a, what is a learning management system that allows us to do that with relative ease? And Open edX has this nice API called Xblox which basically allows anyone to extend the platform based on a relatively uh, simple API. So that was another re uh, reason why we chose that. Um, and, a sec uh, and, and I, I do want to reiterate the second time that sort of this focus that OpenEdX has on Python is just something that suited our team relatively well. That doesn't only apply to the platform itself, which is largely Django, uh, but also the entire uh, deployment framework around open edX that is uh, uh, that is just as open source as the rest of the platform and is very much ansible based so we like that now that's why we chose open edX uh, why did we choose openStack well basically for the same reason it's it's open it has a very large community we like the technology and um, the fact that it is quite um, extensible. Here, in this case, as I'll get to uh, in a few minutes, one thing that was very, very important was the automation capabilities um, in OpenStack, which in some ways are actually far superior to even the automation capabilities that you get in more established infrastructure as a service platforms like AWS or like, um, like a Google Cloud Platform. So um, there's two things that we wanted to do there. One was the relatively simple exercise of um, deploying uh, Open edX on OpenStack. That's the first thing that we did. Open edX itself is very much an AWS-based job, and we wanted to make sure that it was that we could make it easy for anyone to deploy Open edX on OpenStack. That is to say, in an OpenStack private cloud that they themselves operate, or an OpenStack-based public cloud of their choice. Um, we came up with a standardized uh, heat stack uh, for that purpose. Here's a brief overview. So basically, um, the OpenEdX backend is a three node cluster. Uh, it runs MySQL with Galera for replication high availability. It also runs a MongoDB cluster. That's basically three nodes there that you fire up as, as part of a, of a heat template uh, in OpenStack. And then you have any any number of application servers that you stick behind a load balancer. So basically that's like, for those of you familiar with, with the heat terminology, that's a resource group. Uh, so that consists of the app server and a few uh, virtual network ports and so forth that we simply fire up uh, and plug into the load balancer when needed. And when they're no longer needed because load has gone down, we can just kill one of the app servers and, uh, and, and um, scale in that way. And so that makes for a relatively simple and easy way for, for anyone, you can do this, um, to fire up an open edX environment. And uh, again, for those of you who are, who are interested, this is all implemented as a heat template. Um, and just in case you're curious, that consists of a number of, of resources. All of that kind of stuff is uh, in, on, our, on our public GitHub and you're certainly welcome to use that. Basically, as I said, in, in this version of this talk, I don't want to go into too much detail on sort of the, the technical bits and pieces or nuts and bolts of this thing. But just for you to take away, that is a, a heat template environment of, shall we say, medium complexity. It's not in any way rocket science that you can just throw at 
your own OpenStack private cloud or an OpenStack public cloud of your choice, and boom, you get an edX environment. But that is clearly the less interesting part of the whole thing. The much more interesting part is actually leveraging OpenStack from OpenEdX. So the ability to, from our learning management system, make available a basically a cluster to play with for every attendee. So basically, what we want them to be able to do is we want them to just drop into a lab and we want the, to give the course author the ability to define what the lab environment should look like by way of writing, again, a heat template of their own, which can be of completely arbitrary complexity. We can talk about, if we want to, um, you know, 50 different servers in uh, three different networks with two routers between them and a load balancer in front. That, like, or it could be a single VM, whichever. And um, what, we, what we're then able to do is basically to drop the learner into a lab, they get a terminal, I'll show you this in a moment, they get a terminal window um, that pops up for them and in the background we spin up this cluster that they can then actually do their, um, their lab exercises on with the ability to check their own progress, with the ability to completely reset the environment and start over if they run into any kind of problem, and they can completely do that with impunity. Now, I just mentioned something like, um, you know, 50 different servers, three different networks, and so forth. Now, those of you who have ever bought resources in a public cloud, for example, will say, well, doesn't that break the bank, right? If you have, if you've, if you've got, say, something like 30 different people that um, are taking a course, I don't know, that's something like 20 lessons long or so, where you're thinking about something like between 30 and 60 minutes per lesson. The whole idea, of course, is that you can do this in like small bite-sized chunks, basically, as your time permits. So they're doing these maybe 20 lessons over a period of one month. So if you have like 50 different servers that are running or 50 different cloud instances that are running per attendee for a month, that sort of thing can get pretty expensive. And um, of course, that is something that we wanted to address. And uh, here, this is actually something, this is a feature that, to the best of my knowledge, is completely unique to OpenStack Heat. You can't get that out of AWS CloudFormation. You can't get it out of uh, Google Cloud Deployment Manager. Uh, Heat has a very, very neat uh, feature in that it allows us to, well, spin up a stack for each student as they enter their first lab. And then the moment they become, the moment that environment goes idle, so the person just stops interacting with that environment, we can suspend that. So basically, um, uh, Heat allows us to suspend an entire stack, which is essentially, like, simplistically speaking, it's a suspend to disk for every, for every VM that's running in there. And uh, the way that we've automated that is, you essentially have uh, configurable timeouts and um, the, like normally the, the way we do it is if the person just closes their browser, so basically stops interacting with the course for the day because they're done with a lesson or something like that, if they just, stop, if they just close their browser, um, the environment, the, their lab environment suspends within two minutes and if they have their browser open but just don't interact with the environment, then it suspends after 10. But like I said, that's completely configurable. So, um, so you're actually only burning your public cloud provider's CPU cycles when people are actually interacting with the lab environment, which is really, really helpful and, of course, makes the whole thing quite uh, cost effective. The way that we did this is via an open edX X block. That X block is, of course, itself open source. Uh, under the Afero GPL, like the rest of uh, OpenEdX, and it's up on GitHub, and anyone can use it. And um, the way that you configure that, if uh, th this is for people who are already familiar with the, they call it Open Learning XML, that is, or OLX, that's uh, edX's way of, uh, or edX's XML format that you use for, for courses. Um, and then you can uh, put in an element like that that says, this is the stack that we want to use. Here is the OpenStack cloud that we want to point it at and then make that available to a learner. In case you're curious, we're using heat template outputs uh, to 
uh, enable the LMS itself to actually secure shell into the learner's lab environment, and we use this for progress checks. Um, we, we figured that if we're actually doing like everything interactively and practically and so forth, it absolutely makes no sense to like check learner progress with things like quizzes or things like that. Uh, rather, you have a specific objective in the lab, and uh, once, you're, once you think you're done, you get a little uh, button that says check progress, and the LMS will actually shell into your environment and then check for example, do we have a running Ceph cluster here, or do we have a working Kubernetes here, or is, does our configuration look like, uh, like X, Y, and Z? And um, once uh, the progress check determines that, yes, you have completed the lab fully, then uh, you, can, you can go ahead and progress with the, with the next lab. All of this works completely uh, inside your browser. So, um, there are no requirements other than a modern JavaScript-enabled browser on the learner's end. So we don't even rely on an SSH client or anything like that. Um, and this is what I want to show a quick demo of. Let's see if this works here. Hang on. Come on. Okay, so that's a lab environment that has just uh, been suspended. And that should come back shortly, hopefully. There we go. Um, so this, uh, this actually comes out of, uh, of one of our courses. This is a Ceph course. And, uh, and what you see at the top are your lab instructions. At the bottom, um, you see the actual environment that the user has been dropped into. Um, and with this, I'm halfway through the second lab in my course here. Right, um, and so what this is is every uh, every learner gets an environment that, in this case, consists of only four nodes. It could, of course, be more if we wanted to, um, and that's where they're actually building their Ceph cluster. So I could now do this. I could do a Ceph S, right? And we see this is basically a half configured uh, Ceph cluster. For those of you familiar with Ceph. Uh, we have installed packages on all of our nodes. We have already defined our Ceph mons, which are basically the coordinators of a Ceph cluster. So that's why I can, I can do a Ceph S. But as you can see, this thing is currently in a status of health er. So that means that it's currently not a functional cluster because what I still need to do, and I need to scroll up here, right? Uh, I have to still deploy my Ceph OSDs, my object storage daemons. And I can do this here. Go down here, and I'm working right here in my live lab environment. And there we go. That's our Ceph deploy OSD create. And then we run through this, and we're actually completing the deployment of a Ceph cluster here. And like I said, this is what we're doing here, or what it is that we're building, is completely up to the course author. We could be talking about Ceph, we could be talking about Kubernetes, we could be talking about Ansible, Terraform, whichever, right? Uh, just as long as we can run it in VMs on OpenStack, we're golden. There we go. And we're done. And now I do my Ceph S again. And now there's my fully healthy uh, Ceph cluster, right? That just dropped into a health OK. Uh, status, and uh, we've got that. Um, in case you're curious how we're doing this, um, this component here is based on Apache Guacamole. Um, and for those of you familiar with Guacamole, you'll probably uh, recall that um, this thing, which is basically sort of the terminal component with uh, SSH, is just one way of, uh, of using it. And I'd like to show you the other one as well. And I have to change to a different course here. Oh. Go back here. Are you contributing your uh, guacamole Verizon configuration patches upstream? Oh, it's part of the X block, yeah. yeah. Sure. I mean, uh, Guacamole itself is basically, it's a, it's a framework for, for web applications more than a web application in its own right, right? So 
so yeah, we, we, we built our thing and that's, that's part of the, um, of the X block. So, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, the, the question was um, whether or not we're, we're contributing our, our guacamole modif modifications back upstream and the answer is there's actually no modifications to guacamole. It's basically we're building a guacamole based web app and that is part of um, the, the open edX X block. And there we go. Up. And that's an example of doing it in a graphical environment, right? Um, and this is, uh, this is actually built on um, XRDP. Uh, so what, what Guacamole allows us to do is we can use um, SSH with Guacamole or VNC or RDP. And um, so that enables us to, do, to also use this for graphical, uh, for graphical environments, both for Windows and for Linux, because the remote desktop protocol is simply one that is, that is available on both platforms. I neglected to show you something that is reasonably important, so let me switch back to the other course really quickly. It's so nice to have a confidence monitor here as well, so shout out to the AV team yet again. What I neglected to show you here at the bottom is now I have actually deployed my Ceph cluster and I have this thing down here that says check progress. Um, and that again is something that the course author can define. What happens here in the background is that there is a process that runs on the LMS on the learning management system that actually shells into my lab environment and then runs a couple of test commands there. So it actually looks at do we have a healthy and working and responsive Ceph cluster here? And then once we're done, it actually says, okay, you've completed six out of six tasks, so you're good and you can now progress with, uh, with the next part of the lesson and the, next, uh, and the, and the following labs, right? And so what you, what you finally get here is the ability to, uh, to interact with a learning environment that allows you to actually learn the nuts and bolts of, a, of essentially an arbitrarily complex distributed technology on your own you still have the, the opportunity to interact with your peer group. That's actually part of Open edX. It comes with a discussion forum and things like that. It comes with a wiki, et cetera, et cetera. But you're no longer reliant on interacting with an actual instructor. You're not watching a talking head on video. You can actually learn in a, well, shall we say, in a, in a manner that's more suitable to humans, right? That's, a, that's just the way that uh, you can actually acquire uh, the kind of knowledge that you need and uh, that you want to build on, really. So basically, uh, that uh, leads us to this equation, right? Um, it's something that served us really, really well. Um, there, there, are, there are certain things in there that we could not do with any other platform. Uh, one such example is the suspend and resume that I just demonstrated. Like I said, to the best of my knowledge, that is only available with OpenStack. Uh, if we had standardized on on any other infrastructure as a service platform like AWS or Azure or whatever, we simply wouldn't be able to do that. So OpenStack has served us really, really well as far as that is concerned. And the same thing is true for, uh, for OpenEdX. Um, if you are interested in uh, looking into this, uh, all of this is up on, uh, on, on GitHub. There is a, our X block and there is um, our, uh, our integration with everything, including the X block for the most recent OpenEdX Ginkgo release. Um, and uh, actually, we just completed that um, very, very recently. Like I said, everything is AGPL, and you're absolutely welcome um, to, to use that. Okay, so um, that leaves me with a couple of minutes for maybe two or three questions, uh, if you have them. Sure. Yes, sir, Tom. Um, you'll have to Yes, and no, that's fine. Go ahead. I can do um, that. So you're getting people running stuff, uh, their code on your system. So what kind of sandboxing or security is there? Like, obviously, it's suspended. They can't just fire up Bitcoin miners and walk away. But um, how do you defend against people going too far with their systems? OK. So the question was, uh, how, do we, how do we basically uh, keep bad people from doing bad things? 
on these on these systems? Well, um, okay. So number one, the actual lab environment that people can fire up is essentially defined by the course author. That said, this is a cloud environment, uh, and these virtual machines, of course. Um, give the learner to the, the ability to work on them as root, right? Because otherwise it would, be, it would be completely pointless. And so, um, so uh, basically, so number one, we can, we, we, we're, we're always able to like trace what happens on what virtual machine and what user does that belong to, right? So that's for sort of an actual evil actor impersonating a legitimate learner. That's relatively simple. You can get rid of that relatively quickly. Uh, but the more likely thing, of course, is uh, a learner to, you know, to do something like, I don't know, setting an insecure password um, that is then, um, and, and then their resources that they're running being exploited for nefarious purposes. So that is slightly mitigated by the fact that we're always doing this auto suspend thing. So if the, as long as the learner is not interacting with this thing, it, it actually, it's, it's not active. Uh, but still, of course, like while it's running, bad things might happen on, 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 specific, uh, on specific VMs, but that is something that we rely on, um, where we rely on our, uh, our, our detection protocols that we run in the, in the public cloud. So it's basically, uh, so we, we, we monitor uh, for, for, for patterns like you know, sudden surges in bandwidth utilization uh, or, or you know, certain, certain patterns that point to, certain traffic patterns that point to bad things happening. And when, when, we, when we detect something like that, which is just basically like in, within City Cloud, that's part of our standard cloud offering. Um, the common protocol is basically to cut that off and then contact, contact the learner and say, hey, listen, there, there's something wrong with your, with your environment here. Does that answer the question sufficiently? Yeah, I think so. I also wondered if, um, for example, their network is constrained from within their VM or something. They don't have full internet access. So, do. Okay, so uh, the other question was, to what extent is the network constrained of, like, for, the, for the VMs? Well, on the one hand, uh, we, I can pun on this question. I could say, well, that's up to the course author because, of course, they could define all the security groups that they want uh, in, in, the, in the heat template that they're, uh, that they're defining. Um, that said, for most environments, it is not going to make sense, or it's going to be sort of contrary to the learning purpose to actually restrict outgoing internet access, right? So there, we always have to essentially rely on traffic pattern detection to like shut down nefarious activity, which happens very, very rarely. But of course, that still means that we have to be prepared for it. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So, the, so, so the question was, if I if, if I can paraphrase you, uh, how can I use this for the things that I want people to learn? Right. Basically, how do I adapt, adapt that for for my own for my own purposes? Um, we have so on on the, on the one hand, there's a couple of talks that we have online as to how to actually do that sort of thing with our X block. Uh, that said. Uh, edX itself, when you when you deploy your own edX server, it comes with a very handy uh, demonstration course. So basically, it's it's an example course that you can just deploy onto your edX dev, dev stack that essentially teaches you every all, like all of the options that you have in order to build um, in order to build that environment or or to, to build your course. Open edX comes with its own CMS uh, called uh, Open edX Studio which you may or may not want to use. Uh, that essentially depends on your personal preference. If you want to essentially build your entire course uh, from within your browser, from within the CMS, you can do that. You can also do that with the Hestexo X block, so you can configure that from within there as well. Um, we find it more, basically, more, con more conducive to like, courseware development, and we find it easier to manage 
to run our course development uh, straight out of one uh, Git repository per course where we're writing our course content in Markdown. But that is essentially personal preference. Yes? You mentioned you could uh, you screw everything up, uh, bring it down, get up a new instance. How long does that take? OK, question was, if I want to basically start from square one, uh, which is, um, I, I, I think I've, I've messed up somewhere, and so I, I want to essentially reset my entire environment and then bring it back up. Again, that depends on the complexity of the environment that the course author has defined. Um, in, in most of our courses, the initial spin-up takes three to six minutes, and that is also true for, the, for the, a complete reset, because it's the same thing. We literally we throw the stack away and we spin it back up. Whereas um, resuming from, from standby is something like 30 seconds or something like that. Um, there is uh, there's one thing that we have on our XBlock roadmap, uh, which, is, uh, which is something that we've wanted to do for a while. It's also something that's specific to uh, OpenStack Heat. Again, that's a feature that's not, av uh, not available to the best of my knowledge in CloudFormation or, or Google Cloud Platform uh, or anything else, which is basically a safe game feature. Where, uh, because Heat allows us to snapshot an entire stack and then roll back to a specific snapshot state. So what we currently can do is reset and basically start over, which some people really like because they really want to go through the entire sequence of laps twice, which is pretty smart actually. It's like, okay, so I've now understood how everything works and now I want to go through the whole thing one more time. That's actually a really nice thing to do. But what we want to be able to do is something like uh, being able to say, um, go back to the state that it was before I started this lab, right? And that's a, but that's a little more involved. We haven't gotten around to implementing that, but we'd like to have that um, at, at some point in the future. Um, I think I'm out of time, but uh, I will be happy to take more questions. Um, you can grab me after. You can find me in the hallway. I'm going to be here until Friday. I have another talk in the main conference program on Friday afternoon if you're interested in LXC on the desktop. Um, and uh, I'll be more than happy to see you there. Um, Ayan, thanks for having me. You all, thank you for coming. And have a great rest of the afternoon. Thanks.